Welcome back to Let the Journey Begin. I'm your host, Hillary Roberts, alongside my co-host and wild man, Jason Walla. Yeah, what's up, Hill? How you doing? That doesn't sound very wild. They're expecting wild. I'm not going to get wild, you know? I'm on the mend here. Uh, so yeah, so my wild co-host that is not wild today was a bit under the weather. And I'm sorry, uh, you were, weren't feeling well, but you sound so much better today, my friend. I'm in a good place. Any, you know, if things were any better, I'd be in heaven, Hill. I'm, I'm wild. I'm, Dude. Just not, I'm not up to your, your level, you know? I'm just, I'm cruising. Mellow. Okay, well, that's cool. That's cool. Most of the time, it's the other way around. And, but I'm enjoying my, I, I slept like, I don't know, I think 12 hours last night. Yeah. I slept a well, lot. It's amazing what happens when you get connected with God. You do a little bit of meditation. <laughs> you know, I had some time to really reflect and just, you know, mellow out. I've uh, I've got a really good structure. While I was under the weather, I took a lot of time this last week to reprioritize my schedule and my structure of my day to day. And uh, it's cool because I constantly am am you know adding and subtracting from my schedule and kind of figuring out what really works for me. And I've been talking about that for the last year, and I. Uh, it's cool to see how it's developed. It's almost like it started, my routine started in the morning and, you know, kind of went about my day, but I'm really plugging in uh, throughout each day. Uh, and I'm seeing it all, you know, start to manifest and come to fruition, how things are a lot easier and a lot better when I, you know, create that structure, which creates safety. So it's been good. I love that. Yeah. This last week, well, and as you know, I've had some months of adrenal fatigue, but this, you know, these last couple of weeks I've been able to work out fairly consistently. I'm feeling good about my body and, um, Damon and his wife and his little daughter were in town and we were able to write a couple of songs and I got to hang out with, uh, his daughter and, and have fun. And I just got a new arcade and we were playing Donkey Kong and, yeah. this pac-man and all kinds of stuff and i just i just love it i love kids and i love uh and i i just i just love uh spending time with people that are amazing like you and ashley and everything like that but and christina his wife we know we got to have a lunch day and go hang out and shop a bit and so it was just really nice you know it's just really nice Seems like you're in a good place every time i talked to you this last week you were working out literally every single time i called you or you, called <laughs> I you, know. you were working out it's good. I good love you. It. Well, it's yeah, good I to be it. back. I'm excited it. to hear about our guests that we have on today. You've spoken uh, nothing but amazing things. So why don't you uh, bring her on without further ado? Okay. Well, on Let the Journey Begin, we don't just focus on addiction and recovery. We like to bring on individuals that have endured all sorts of trauma because many... Many times the experiences and symptoms can overlap. Our guest today definitely has one of those stories. She's a singer, songwriter, blogger, public speaker, and overall mental health advocate. Everybody welcome Cami Julianne. Hi guys. Hi, Thank you so Cammie. much for having me. Oh, we're so excited you're here. here. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> so we ask all our guests this question. Girl, okay. what did what did you want to be when you grew up? A singer. Honest to God, that's it. Awesome. You know, you know, that's honestly, I mean, I think I sang more than I talked when I was little, to be honest. I like that. <laughs> I like, what inspired so, you? What motivated you to want to be a singer? You know, to be honest, I, I hate to be so deep all of a sudden, but I think for me, it was like, I didn't really have a voice growing up. And so mm -hmm. for me, it was like, <clears throat> for me, like my voice was my power and that's how, and I'll get into that more with my story, but it was my way of speaking my truth. And so, and I didn't know that, you know, as a kid, I just thought I like to sing and I like to dance and to just have fun. And um, so for me, that was just my way of kind of being creative and having fun and expressing myself. And what, so- What do you mean you didn't have a did. voice? You know, I grew up and I was in some, you know, abusive situations. And so for me personally, that was my uh, first emotional, you know, uh, disconnect. Right. And so at that time I didn't, you know, as a kid, you don't really know what the, what, what an emotional or like traumatic experience is. You just think it is what it is. This is what's happening. Um, and so for me personally, that was my first 
experience of like a disconnect from my body. And so as I grew out of that experience, I struggled with an eating disorder and um, trichotillomania, which is a uh, hair pulling disease or disorder. And so it's a compulsive uh, where I I pull my eyelashes. Um, Some people pull from their, their scalp or their brows or whatever. And so Uh, for me personally, that's what I would go to instead. So that for me was my coping skill. I I don't even like to use that word because I didn't do it like intentionally, right? Like it was just my, it was like what I did, you know, it was what I, Mm -hmm. what I knew it was my survival. Uh, And so when I say I didn't have a voice, that's what I mean. Like I went to those things instead of, you know, saying, Hey, like I was hurt. This is what happened to me. Instead, I went to those things because I didn't know if people would believe me or not, if that makes sense. Of course. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Now yeah. I have a question. I hate to that. just jump in on all that. No, but. that's what we want to hear about. That's what we want to talk yeah. about, you know, and it's important to, yeah. <laughs> to get all spectrum of this. Was the, yeah. was the, when you were like the, how do you, what's the term of it again? Uh, where you pull the hair? Oh, it's called trichotillomania. It's very long. Uh, so I call it, I, a lot of people just call it trick. trick. Uh, it's a yeah. form of OCD. Uh, and it is actually really, it's, what they're calling it now is a BFRB, a body focused repetitive behavior. So it's stemmed from, uh, you know, like when people like a lot of people do this, like they bite their nails, right? So it's like mm-hmm. kind of the same thing, except people will pull their hair and you don't even know that they're doing it half the time. Like so you're cognitively not even it. present around it. You're exactly. Just, yep. Wow. Because I struggled with so OCD have, and stuff and I had other yes. things that I did, uh, to cope mm-hmm. with it, but that's exactly. fascinating. OCD is a, yes. a is a big thing. Uh, was OCD it's a big, so big thing that played into your eating disorder? Oh my god, it was the biggest, mm-hmm. and I had no idea, you guys. Like I literally thought I was just like I knew I wasn't crazy, right? Like I knew I could live a normal life. I knew that I was able to, and I hate using the word crazy, by the way, but like I I knew that I was able to be functional. But I would have these like intrusive thoughts like, well, what if one day I do go crazy? What if one day I whatever, you know, I would just have these like crazy thoughts like, well, what if I just one day lose it and I just, you know, I don't know. I'm trying to think of something that I used to think drive off a cliff or whatever. And not that I would ever do it, but I get so scared that like, what if one day I would. Right. And so it was I learned through all this therapy that I did. These are all coping skills. Um and again, I don't like to use that word, but it it was a distraction, right? It's my body's survival of going, hey, I don't want you to think about these traumatic events that you experienced as a kid. I don't want you to think about the uh, abuse that we went through. So I'm going to I'm going to make you think about all of these other chaotic things so that you spin and you spiral and you don't think about what really happened and you get out of your body and you go into fight or flight and then you're going to just spiral and you're just going to think about what if you jump off a cliff or what like let's pull your hair or let's disconnect you by, you know, you weighing yourself or you throwing up or you restricting or whatever it is. Wow. Wow. I That's totally so relate to that because I, yeah. I, I've gone through two different cycles in my life where I had eating disorder stuff that came up. And I believe, well, more than I think actually three, because as a kid I would restrict because it was like the only yeah. thing I could control. And then yes. later on the bulimia came and uh, that was, oof. It's a violent disease. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Well, look, and being, you're a, an OCD, and being a singer, yeah, being a singer, it was really bad for your, you know, it wasn't logical. So, but anyway. Oh my gosh, a hundred percent. Yeah, Sorry, no, the, Jay, go ahead. The, no, the whole OCD thing, it wasn't a matter of, am I going to be crazy? I thought I was crazy, you know? Yes. But it's like, that's the problem is, is that repetitiveness of, mine was specifically with hand washing and it became just like a, mm-hmm. addiction and alcoholism. It became yes. uh, my everything. I mean, I couldn't function. Mm-hmm. You know I mean? I literally at 12 years old had to wear gloves because my hands were yes. so raw um, that I'd have to wear gloves with Neosporin in them. Um, I'll never yes. forget, you know, oh. this goes, those are the traumatic. I never thought I experienced trauma, but that is traumatic within itself to have to endure those things as such a young kid. Oh sure. my God. Absolutely. And it's, it's, you know, it's honestly, even the, the healing around OCD personally, like my heart goes out to everyone that has to go through that work because it is so much harder than just stopping drinking or, you know, getting in recovery with an eating disorder, because it's, when your brain is telling you to do something and you think that that's the survival coping skill that you have to do to live 
and, and you're, you know, you have medical professionals telling, you no, you, you don't need to wash your hands another time, right. Or you don't need to pull your hair again or whatever it is. You feel like the world is ending. And so it's that exposure therapy of going, like I, I went through, um, an intrusive thought, like for a while, I thought, what if I was schizophrenic? And so I would just constantly ask for, um, reassurance from my therapist at this one time in my life when actually I was going through, um, uh, panic attacks and I, and I, for some, I just, my OCD just spun on what if I'm schizophrenic? What if I'm, what if I'm like, you know, making everything up in my head, whatever. And, um, my therapist goes, okay, well, what if you are? And I'm like, oh, you're right. Well, then I guess I would just get on medication and I'd be fine. And she's like, exactly. Like it, the OCD just keeps you spiraling. Right. So once you do the exposure <clears throat> and yep. you agree with those intrusive thoughts and you go, oh, well, yeah, maybe I am. It, it's like a bully. OCD is like a bully. Once you just say, oh, well, yeah, maybe I am schizophrenic. Maybe I do drive off a cliff. Maybe I, you know, maybe I do wash my hands one more time and whatever. You're like, oh, OK. OK, well, now what? Like, what are you going to take from me now? You know what I mean? And then it kind of it makes the OCD go, oh, you're not scared of me anymore. Well, I'm going to throw something else at you. Yeah, yeah. No, sorry to interrupt you, but I was just curious. Did your traumatic, oh. was there an event, your traumatic events that kicked in your OCD? Yeah. Yes. Thanks, I was Jane. sexually abused as a child. And so for me, that was a lot of, uh, and to be completely honest with you, I didn't remember it for years. So when I became a teenage, like probably mm -hmm. about, I think I was like 18 when, um, so what happened for me, I'll just say this, like I had that experience with the abuse, didn't remember it, just was pulling my hair. But yeah, that was a really big piece of my work. And so for me, it was like I went into treatment for an eating disorder at 16 and uh, Paula Abdul is my mentor. So that was a big thing for me. So she came in and she was like, you know, I was struggling with an eating disorder. She had gone through that in her life with being a dancer mm -hmm. and a cheerleader and all of that. Yeah. And she was like, all right, you're going to treatment. And, you know, at that point I'm 16 and I'm in my rebel stage. Right. So I'm like treatment, like I'm in high school. Like, I don't know what you're thinking. Right. So Paula sent me to treatment. I go to treatment. I go back into high school because I had to take a year off of high school. So I repeated my junior year. I get out of treatment. I start having seizures and my body is having memories pretty much. Oh. So and so then I'm like, okay, why am I having seizures? Like my MRI comes back normal. My EEG comes back normal. What's happening, right? No idea that I had trauma at this point in my life. So I start doing deep work. Now I see that I, you know, I learned that the, I, don't, I don't know if you guys have heard of this book, The Body Keeps the Score, but this is very common mm -hmm. with people with, you know, childhood abuse. You go from kind of this, this stage of, you know, the body having all of these memories and they hold on to it and your, your brain literally blocks it out for survival. And as you grow up, you know, your body or your mind, excuse me, kind of protects yourself through OCD or through trichotillomania or an eating mm -hmm. disorder or alcoholism or whatever, whatever it is. Not to say that every person with an addiction has, you know, childhood abuse, but it, it is very common. Mm -hmm. um, and so my job now that I'm older is to create awareness around that. Um, because I think it's a lot more, uh, prevalent than, than a lot of people would like to admit. Wow. So let me ask you, what was the mm -hmm. driving force that made you get help? Like, what was that? What was that thing that happened? Gosh, that's a good question. Well, I was in high school and I mean, I was, I was the sickest I'd ever been with my eating disorder. I, I was eating about maybe 300 calories a day. Um, and my, both of my parents had cancer. So they were in the hospital, both dealing with their own cancer. I know this was like, God, I was, I was a sophomore. So my mom had breast cancer. Three weeks later, my dad got diagnosed with prostate cancer and I just lost it. I mean, I'm 16 at this point and I was oh. just like, F this, like I'm done, I'm done you know? Um, and so I went into a hospital at this point for the anorexia and similar to you, Hillary, like I came out of there and just got into bulimia because they, all they did for me during that stay for a month was get me into a refeeding process of, okay, let's just get her to gain weight. Let's get her physical body back into shape. Um, and then I just got out of there and I'm like, okay, great. Now I'm addicted to food. 
and I can't stop eating and I don't want to keep it. And I'm just going to start throwing up. So then I went into this whole bulimia stage. Well, my body can't handle that. So of course, like it's going to react. Right. And so I went into the seizures and so ended up going back into treatment again, stayed for about two or three years. I went to a treatment center in Orange County, which is how I got into Orange County and moved down there. Um, and that is when I started to do the really deep trauma work. And that's when I knew I just had a feeling in my body and in my mind. I'm like, I knew, I know something happened. I don't know what it was. And my therapist said, okay, let's just start with what you remember. And so I'm like, okay, I know that. And I mean, it was small facts. It was like, I know I loved Hillary Duff when I was eight. Okay. Write that down. I know I loved, um, you know, like I, I know that I, I really don't like a specific type of smell. Okay. Write that down, you know, and it would just be these random things that really made no sense at the time. And yep. by the end of our, uh, our therapy, it would be like, okay, well now I see that the abuse happened here and, and Hillary Duff's music was playing in the background or whatever. And it was Ugh. like, it just, it pulled everything together for me. And the reason I share this is because if I didn't trust my gut and my intuition on those things, I don't know that I would be able to trust myself at all with anything. And, and it's not to say that everyone has to, you know, go and dig up everything if they don't want to. But for me, my body needed it because if I didn't do that, my body wouldn't, I I literally would have died. Like my body couldn't handle. I don't think if you don't dig it up, you don't fully recover. I mean, that's just my personal belief, but I have a question for you for our audience because you're, uh, you're young. Uh, when, if you can just give us a time frame, when did the trauma, the sexual trauma happen? Because Mm -hmm. you got help at 16, which is uh, still uh, very young. You know what I mean? So I mean, how, how many, when did that happen? How long, how many years went by before you actually ended up getting help? Um, it was eight years old. Then it was 12 years old. And I don't, I can't tell you how many, I don't know. I can't remember how Ugh. often it was, but it was, it was a lot between that. So, um, so, but from eight to I eight mean, to 16 though, I mean, so it was yeah. eight years, I mean, that you eight were years, during yeah. this trying to process this and what yeah. that led to is your body, you had sexual trauma, which ignited OCD, which then ignited anorexia. And then it made you bulimic, which put your mm-hmm. body into shock after being in survival mode to having seizures all before you yes. were 16 years old. Yes. And to be completely real and authentic with you, since December 3rd, I've been having seizures again. And so that was like a big thing for me too. I've been, ha- I've had 35 since December 3rd. And oh so, my gosh, and I know, girl. I know, but it's fine now. I'm on like, a, a, I'm doing deep work again and it's cool. Like I'm in a place where I can stay in my adult and go, cause I, in my work, I, I have to say like, and I was, I was really hesitant with this, right? Like I have this thing about inner child, right? Like for me, it was really hard to get into the whole inner child work. And now it's like the one thing that has saved my life because the inner child work is the biggest healing device I've ever worked with in my life. Like my inner child is, you know, the thing that, or the work that, that I needed to heal. And so for me, it's like, okay, how do I stay in my woman or my adult and take care of my inner child and do this deep work and keep her safe. Right. So for me, it's not weighing myself. It's no matter what, not binging and purging and not restricting it's, you know, um, it's just setting those ground rules. Like, you know, for some people it's not drinking, right? It's not for me actually right now, it's not drinking and not that I struggle with drinking, but because I'm in an emotional state, I know that I don't want to put myself in a position to where I would have an issue with it. Right. So these, these things keep me safe and keep me boundaried so that I can do the deep work and have this stuff come up and be okay to work through it. That's a well, so at its finest. Yeah. And this is right. Every, cause see, like I, I, uh, I've, I've worked under the PM melody for a format of that inner child and, you know, having pictures of the little girls in the ages yes. that they were abused. And yeah. I've done a lot of work with that. And so you're not, our, our listeners here, they don't think that stuff is cheesy at all. <laughs> right. It's right. Not. Exactly. Well, it's, it's not. A- so, Cami, I want to talk to you, though, about solution. You know, I mean, it's we, we like yes. to get a, a background of the story and stuff. But 
So, I mean, with all that stuff that was going on, you know, what do you do today to maintain? I'd love to hear what you did. You know, if there's, again, if it's, if you're open to it, just if you, what you did for your OCD, did you take medication? You currently take medication. I've still take medication to this day uh, for my OCD. I'd love to just kind of hear a little bit of uh, of a wrap up of of what you did to kind of take that on. And then what you do today on the day to day to maintain and sustain the awareness that you have and, and work on yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, oh gosh, there's so many great tools that I have. So the first thing is, is my daily schedule is so important to me. So having a daily routine for me has been the biggest tool, um, starting the day in spirituality. So I try to break up my day by spirituality, product, productivity, creativity, and connection. So starting the day off spirituality with God, right? So praying, meditating, getting outside, getting grounded, feeling, you know, connected to God. Um, that for me is really important to start the day off productivity, right? Like creating, um, you know, a connection to, or, you know, getting connected to my work, doing what I need to do to get through the day with work career, and then getting into my creativity to release that whatever emotional stuff is coming up for me, or just to have fun, right? Um, And then as far as like medication wise, I still take medication. I uh, really trust my psychiatrist, which was a really big thing for me. Um, Letting go of the judgment of taking medication was a big thing for me a few years ago as well, um, because I think a lot of us get stuck on um, that judgment and that fear. And uh, I just had to let go of it and go, okay, I'm not, you know, I'm not God. Like I'm a human and I I struggle and I'm going to have to take something and that's okay. Um, and so that's what I had to do. And so, um, there's no shame in that. Definitely. So taking medication was really important for me. And, um, I still practice exposure therapy with OCD when I, when I feel an intrusive thought come in. Um, and that's often like, and I have more awareness now, but, um, when I do see or feel an an intrusive thought come up and sometimes it'll be smaller, they're definitely not as big now, but if I have one, even around food, um, if I like, sometimes it'll come up and I'll, and I'll think like, oh, I don't want to eat that. Right. Or something along those lines, I'll go, okay, well, why not? And I'll break it down to myself. Um, and sometimes if it's still kind of a struggle, I'll reach out to someone, um, my mentor or someone that has, you know, that knows my story and kind of can call me out on my BS and, and hold me accountable. Uh, and then I do have an accountability partner too, that I reach out to every night and I say, okay, this is my goal for tomorrow. Um, and here's how I took care of myself for today. And then, um, I hold myself accountable to that person. Hey, exposure therapy. Is there a tool that you could give to our listeners that they could, that they could process this on their own? I mean, are you advise that it's done with the therapist? Is there tools they can have to to help Um, become more aware? I would say... The best exposure therapy to do on their own would be journaling like uh, and kind of like, so for example, a fear that they have, right? So I'll break it down. Like, what if I go crazy, right? So what if I go crazy? Okay, well, if I were to go crazy, I would drive off a cliff. If I drove off a cliff, I'd fall into the ground. What would I do if I fell into the ground? I'd go to the hospital. I'd end up alone, whatever, like, like literally journaling out the story in your head to the point where you get to the end of the story. Um, I would not do real, like physical exposure therapy unless you have a therapist with you, because I just wouldn't want to like, you know, there's just whatever liabilities, but, um, I would say definitely doing exposure therapy with a therapist would be great, but journaling out the exposure is so helpful, but it is very scary. So have someone that you trust to, you know, um, process it with. So Absolutely. real quick, you would yeah. identify the emotion or the thought that you're going through and then play the tape out on paper. Literally play the tape out and don't be afraid to like actually go through the exposure, like write out the fears of what you think you would do or what you think you would be afraid I've to I've never do. heard of this. Wow. Mm-hmm. It's wow. scary. And you know what, to be honest with you, I had my eating disorder therapist and I had my OCD therapist. So my OCD therapist is like, I want you to write out what you would do if you were to go crazy or whatever. And my eating disorder therapist is like, I don't think we need to do that. And (laughs) my OCD therapist is like, yeah, we do. Like, we're going to break this down and make her like help her realize like she like, because then you get down and get down to it and you're like, oh, like, okay, like none of this is real. Right. And so it's breaking it down to see how bizarre our thoughts are and how they're not, they're just a thought. It's just a thought, you know? Yep. What a trip. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. And so 
We so thank you so much. Yeah, we do that. We do that writing with fears. Uh, I've been ta- I was taught that a while back where you just get all the way to the end of the fear. It's just like yes. the, how the brain goes. Um, but if you were to give our listeners one action for the day, what would it be? Okay, I would say to shield. And so when I say shield, I mean to close your eyes and just to breathe in like white light or something that feels safe and to cover your body in a shield. And that doesn't mean to block out love. That doesn't mean to block out light. That means to just protect yourself from other energies or other emotions that aren't yours that you don't have to take on. And that means to just keep yourself safe, if that makes sense. That makes total sense. And that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And tell us how old you are now. You're just, you're so beautiful. (laughs) Thank you. I'm 26. Oh, she's gorgeous, you guys. (laughs) Uh, I'm going to be calling you for therapy help, man. Damn. I know, right? I thought I I met every therapist in the world. I just learned like three new things today. That was probably one of the most amazing actions for the days that I've had on this show. You're, I mean, we've had quite a few guests now that was that marks number one or two for me for sure so it was that's something amazing. i will be taking and look Thank your you. story is so incredible um yeah you have your are you're, you're going to impact and and help so many people and i think in the day in the world that we live Thank in you. today specifically around so many people that are really opening up and identifying the trauma and the things that they went through we need people such as yourself that can show that you can get through it it takes a lot of hard work but the, yes. the good news is that there, there is light at the end of the tunnel and you're a prime example. You're 26. You have so much to offer and you know, Thank it's, you. it is mm-hmm. really, really appreciate what you're doing using your voice. And I mean, there's so much stuff that we didn't get to talk about. I mean, with your music career and so much stuff that you're doing today, uh, we'll have to have you come back and just, you know, do a, 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 a follow up in regards to just, you know, where your life's at and, and what you're going through and, and also to, to just open up with all the stuff that you went through. So thank you so much yes. for being here and just very Yeah, grateful. girl. Thank, thank you. you. Thank so you so much for having me. And thank I'm so glad to be so, connected so to you. I'm going to call me you this too. week and we'll yes, talk. I would, I would love that so much. You guys, thank you so much for having me and just for creating this safe space. It's awesome. So Cammy, where can everyone find you? Give us all the places. Yes, absolutely. So you guys can find me on Instagram at Cami Jelaine, C-A-M-I-J-U-L-A-I-N-E and CamiJelaine.com. 